Well, we're not in Oak Haven today. We are taking a field trip because we want to talk about a plant that is um, currently having a severe impact on woodlands in our area, Lesser Celandine. It's a plant that we have scattering of in our property, but we're doing our best to get rid of it, so we don't really have a good place to talk about it. And so we wanted to share with you um, this area. This is at the Cincinnati Nature Center. And if you look around here, you are hard pressed to find a square foot of bare soil that is not covered with lesser celandine here. This just shows you how invasive and how aggressive this is. This is a non-native, very invasive plant. Uh, it was first found in the United States in the mid to late 1800s, but is just now kind of taking over. And I think we'll, we'll get into a little bit of why I think that is uh, a little bit later. But very pretty plant, beautiful. I mean, people come into the nature center and they think, oh, this is wonderful. We have this, this beautiful yellow flower here that's, uh, that's every place. So you can recognize the yellow flower. Uh, it's got maybe, you know, eight or nine petals or so. Um, has this heart-shaped leaf. The leaf is mottled. It has dark green spots and lighter green spots mixed together. That, to me, helps me identify it from uh, other things. So this is lesser celandine. There is a greater celandine. It's actually in a different family completely. Lesser celandine is in the buttercup family. Greater celandine is in the poppy family. The other plant that we have in our woods, uh, not natively, but uh, in our gardens, is celandine poppy, which again is a poppy, not a buttercup, so it's not related to this. The only thing that we have that you might confuse this with would be marsh marigolds. Marsh marigold also comes up in the spring and has a beautiful yellow flower like this, but it only has five petals, whereas you can see celandine poppy has significantly more than that. Um, marsh marigold also tends to have much uh, bigger um, leaves and grow in patches more, uh, rather than this just kind of a carpet that's spread all over the place. You also find marsh marigolds in better quality areas. Um, this is very invasive. Marsh marigold is a native that you find in, in good quality um, swampy fen areas. So we've identified the problem. I think it's pretty obvious here as you look at this hillside. Um, what do we do about it in our woodlands? Um, because we're open to using herbicides, we treat it with a glyphosate. We treat it with a 4% glyphosate solution. Some people say you can get away with a 1.5% or 2% or 3%, but they also say that you should treat it several times throughout the, you know, for several years in a row. We find that we've treated it with 4% glyphosate and it kills it out. We have yet to have it come sprout back up again after treating it with a 4% glyphosate solution. Given my choice, I would rather treat it once and have it uh, recover rather than keep throwing the herbicide in it over, uh, over a number of years. So that's just our perspective. Some people will treat it, they don't want to use herbicides, they will treat it by digging it out of the ground. The problem with that is that there's tubers um, attached to the roots here, that if you don't get all of the tubers, it, they will sprout up into new plants. If you disturb it and the tubers roll away, those will sprout into new plants. So because we're at the nature center here, I don't really have the ability to dig up some plants to show you what these tubers look like or what it looks like if you if you chose to, to dig into an area. And it's not necessarily a bad idea if you just have one plant here or one plant there. Um, I just, in a very big area, it really disrupts the, uh, the soil, which is bad for two things. Um, one, it just, it disrupts anything else that's living there. The other thing is that when you when you dig in the soil, it tends to bring any other weed seeds up to the surface. Weed seeds uh, generally, by their nature, uh, germinate when they get exposed to the sun. So when they're buried in the soil, they're more likely to rot away. You bring them up to the surface and then they, they sprout. So we're going to go to another location uh, where we can dig up some lesser celandine and I can show you what the tubers look like and uh, we'll go through that process. So we wanted to show you what happens when you dig it up. Okay, so we've dug up this, this patch here, and you can see that at the base, there are these tubers. It's just full of them. You know, there's a dozen or so right here. So if you're digging up, and any of these get separated in, in the soil, that's going to sprout up into a new plant. Um, if you throw this into a compost pile, I don't think your compost pile, or most compost piles are not hot enough to, uh, to actually kill this. Uh, so you may just be spreading it along with your compost. So you can see, as I dug this up, I miss tiny little plants. You know, it's hard to dig up a big enough area that you get all of them so you don't leave tiny plants and tiny bulbs 
that are just going to, once you fill it back in again, are just going to re-sprout and come back into the same area. So this is a good example. You can see where there's this patch of lesser celandine. In a lawn, there's nothing else around. The question is, what's going to happen to this over time? It's starting to spread out. In a lawn, you can treat it with an, a, a broadleaf herbicide that will leave the grass and will just kill this part of it. Um, I would think a treclopyr might be a good uh, uh, example of that. Uh, there's two subspecies of lesser celandine, one of which produces bulblets all around underneath where the, the flower stalk is right now. As the flower stalk dies back, the bulblets will form. So those will, um, if, if those get knocked off and spread around into the soil, they also will produce more flowers. Um, my personal preference is we just hit it with the herbicide and get it killed and let the other stuff come in and, and take care of it. Now with that said, right now is not a, the best time to be treating it because there are all these flowers and if you treat it with herbicide you're also spraying the, the flowers. I feel very comfortable with glyphosate. You, you put it on the plant, the target plant. If some of it gets into the soil, it's bound very tightly to the soil. It doesn't spread around. Concerns about groundwater um, contamination or going and spreading into non-target species, it really just doesn't happen with glyphosate because it is uh, it has such an affinity for the, the clay, clay uh, particles in the soil that it, it binds and just stays right where it's at. So I feel pretty good about that. But it is true that if you, um, if you spray the flowers, you could have bees and pollinators come and actually eat the glyphosate. Now, that doesn't hurt them directly, but th there is evidence to show that the, the gut biome within the bees is impacted by glyphosate, just like our gut biome. If, if we take glyphosate, glyphosate, glyphosate doesn't, uh, doesn't poison us directly, but it definitely could impact our gut biome uh, in ways that would affect our nutrition. That's my, my opinion from checking out uh, my sources. Um, definitely look into it yourself if you're interested. Now, if I was going to be treating an area like this where it's definitely an upland situation, we've got a, some slope here, I have no problem with using a regular what I would call a Roundup formula, a, a glyphosate that's mixed up like Roundup. It has surfactants in it that are made for upland situations. Lesser celandine tends to grow in floodplains and along creeks. It won't grow in the creek bed necessarily, but it'll grow along the edges of creeks. If you're growing near an aquatic habitat, I wouldn't use the regular uh, glyphosate formulas that we use in upland situations. The, the surfactant that they put into those, um, those formulas um, are very toxic to aquatic fish. So they make separate um, formulas to use in aquatic habitats, like in wetland areas or th places where it could get into the water. They, um, th they used to use Rodeo. Rodeo was the, the kind of the common named, uh, it was a Monsanto product that you would use in a wetland area. Rodeo is not on the market anymore, um, but there's other people that have taken over. So, so uh, do a search for uh, aquatic friendly glyphosate formulations. We're talking about using Shore Clear Plus, which uh, we get at uh, Rural King. It's about $40 for a gallon of it. It comes in a 16% solution. Again, we treat with a 4% solution, so we cut it by, by a quarter. Um, we cut it by four so that uh, we'd get a 4% solution. That already has mixed in it a, a surfactant that uh, can be used in an aquatic situation. Uh, so that solves that problem. But there's a lot of a lot of uh, other off brands that are out there. Just make sure that it says that it's it's okay for aquatic habitats. The other thing people will do that don't want to use uh, herbicides. The other thing that's recommended or people have tried is to put down black plastic or um, newspaper or something to mulch it heavily. Again, I have a hard time with the black plastic idea because you, you put it down, you seal off the ground. And the idea is that that will heat up the ground and will kind of sterilize the ground. It will keep things from growing underneath it. I don't really want to sterilize the ground. I don't want to kill off the microorganisms and the insects and the other things that are growing there. And if you, if you block that off with black plastic, you're going to be killing a lot more than just the, the lesser celandine. I, I think it's more environmentally friendly to use an herbicide that's not going to impact those, um, those insects and some of those other things that's just going to kill off the lesser celandine it will, it's, uh, glyphosate is non-selective, so it will kill off other things that, um, that it comes in contact with. So if there are other um, flowers or things, it will, it will kill those things. But ideally, 
choose a time to do it when there's less of those things around and there's just lesser celandine. We have an advantage around here is that lesser celandine is one of the first things that comes up. So it will come up in the spring pretty early and you can spray it before the spring wildflowers start to come up. So you can uh, knock back the lesser celandine before the other flowers come up and then the other flowers will come up around it. It may not get rid of it completely. Again, this fills in so much and you've got new tubers that are sprouting up all of the time. But it will, it will um, knock it back so that if you have a whole mat like this, it will take care of most of the mat. So then you just have spotted areas to, to take care of and you don't have to treat a huge area again. So if it's my goal to treat this before it flowers, that means that I need to recognize it pretty well by just the leaves. So I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about what the leaves look like and how we tell it from other plants. Um, again, the marsh marigold has a much bigger leaf. The lesser celandine is, has this mottled leaf, okay? And then if you look at the base of it, the stem has a, a ridge all the way down it. And then the leaf kind of wraps around, so you can't even see the stem when you're looking at it from the top because it comes around and wraps a little bit. That's a little different from uh, a couple of our other plants that we have on our property that um, uh, we would confuse it with. Uh, purple cress has a similar, similarly shaped leaf, but if you look at the back of it, it's actually purple on the back, where on the, in the front it's green. It again is um, more of a bluish green rather than this bright green of the lesser celandine. The other issue, the other plant that we have that has the same shaped leaf out at the same time as lesser celandine is small flowered buttercup. Small flowered buttercup does not have this where it wraps around the, the um, petiole, the, the stem of the leaf. It is green on the back, just like the lesser celandine, um, but it's also an evenly, even green all the way through it. It doesn't seem to be quite as glossy as lesser celandine. You notice that with lesser celandine, the, the leaves are glossy and the petals are super glossy. They almost look like they're wet all the time or like somebody had sprayed shellac on them. So my goal here with this video is twofold. One, if you have a, an infestation of lesser celandine, I'd like you to recognize it and know how to treat it. The other thing I would like to do is to strike terror into your hearts so that when you look at this and you would see just what a potential disaster this plant could be. When you see a few plants of it, you'll think, oh, I better get rid of that right away because if I let it go, it's going to be monumental. You know, I am so glad that I don't have this to deal with. I mean, we're talking about acre upon acre upon acre of dense lesser celandine. You're not going to be able to do anything with this without doing a lot of ecological damage to, what, what else, to everything else that's around. I think it's doing more ecolog ecological damage to leave it here but it's a it's a lose-lose situation and I, I feel really bad about that so how do you keep it from getting like this one make sure that you take care of it when it's small when you've got it you know throw your investment into getting rid of small patches of it while you can two it spreads by these tubers and these bulblets and by seeds depending on what subspecies you have Make sure that you're not transferring those from one area to another. Make sure that you're cleaning your boots well. Make sure that you're not driving, you know, a gator through an area that you're picking up dirt which has bulblets or tubers on it and then driving into another area that doesn't have it and then spreading them around. Because that's how this gets around. This doesn't get around so much from animals. This gets around by us moving it around. We have to be really conscious of the fact that we don't want to, we don't want to introduce this into areas that are, are more pristine. Thanks for coming along with us today. Thanks for listening to me rant a little bit. I appreciate that. Um, if this was helpful, you know, hit the like button. Um, if this type of video is useful to you, we appreciate subscribers. Um, if you have comments about what we're doing, what you're doing, what you think would work better, what you um, think we should be doing differently, please leave it in the comment section. We like to create a dialogue. Anyway, thanks for coming along.